A fairly simple application of Bernoulli's equation is in calculating how much time it takes to drain a tank of a certain height and diameter through a drain hole of a certain diameter. Today we're going to derive that equation. No hard feelings if you don't stick around for all the maths, but it's there if you need it. But more importantly, we're then going to go test it in my kitchen. We're then going to go look at whether the equation works. Spoiler alert, it doesn't. But we're going to look at how much we're off by and look at some of the reasons why we're off. And then we're going to look at what, what it is that we do to fix these situations. The equations that I use, the sheet that I use to make my predictions, as well as the experimental results, all appear in the sheet in the description. So you can go use it yourself and look what it is that I've done. Enjoy. We start with the theory. Take a cylindrical tank with diameter capital D and height H. Assume the tank is a circular drain hole with diameter small d in its base. We define two points, A at the base of the tank and B in line with the liquid level. We then apply Bernoulli's equation to these two points. Bernoulli basically states that at any point in this tank, the energy contained by the liquid by virtue of its pressure, velocity and height is constant. The first thing to note is that we can get rid of both pressures because the tank is open to atmospheric pressure, both at the top and at the drain point. Since both are atmospheric pressure, they will cancel each other out. Next, we define the height of A as the zero height line, so we can get rid of another term. Then we assume the velocity at the liquid level inside the tank is negligible. After I performed the experiments, I actually checked this assumption for the biggest drain hole and the fastest flow rate. For a velocity of 1.9 meters per second through the drain hole, the level in the tank at its peak is moving at 0.015 meters per second. So it's a reasonable assumption to get rid of this velocity term. It's gonna have so little impact. And so we get an expression that says the velocity through the drain hole is only a function of the height of the liquid in the tank. The velocity through the drain hole can be expressed in terms of the flow rate if we divide it by the area of the drain. And so we arrange everything and get a nice expression for the flow rate through the drain as a function of two things. The size of the drain and the level of liquid in the tank. Increasing either of these increases the flow rate through the drain. And your intuitions should tell you as much. The way you get more liquid through the drain is with a bigger drain or with more water in the tank. The problem we have is that as we drain the liquid, the height in the tank is changing, which means that this is a time dependent problem and we need a differential equation to solve it. We start with a basic mass balance. The rate of accumulation in the tank equals the flow into the tank less the flow out of the tank. Since there is only a flow out of the tank, we can ignore the inlet term. But it is very common to be given a problem where there is a constant flow rate into the tank too. It doesn't complicate the problem too much if that is the case. You just plug in a constant value for the in term. We replace the accumulation term with the derivative of the remaining volume in the tank, V, with respect to time. And this is equal to the negative drainage rate because the volume of the tank is dropping over time. We can then take our previous expression for flow rate, which we derived from Bernoulli, and shove it in here. I need to replace the height of fluid in the tank on the right hand side with a volume term because it needs to match the dv on the left hand side for me to be able to solve this. The height of a cylinder is equal to its volume over its cross-sectional area, which is obviously a function of tank diameter. So I get an expression for height and I put it back into the differential equation and after a little bit of work I get the following expression. If we clear our heads a little bit of all the maths we did and take a step back, 
This expression tells us that in order to know the volume of liquid left in the tank after a certain amount of time, I need to know the volume right at the start, the amount of time that has passed, the diameter of the drain hole, and the diameter of the tank. That's it. Any volume I calculate can also easily be converted into a height by dividing it by the cross-sectional area of the tank. I of course consulted the internet to double check my working out. I see it's more popular to show this equation in terms of the height of the liquid in the tank rather than the remaining volume of the tank, but here you have both. Note that there are subtle differences in the equation, so be careful of them. There's another good question that comes up, and that is, how does this equation look for a tank that doesn't have a simple open drain at the base, because actually no tank has a simple open base at the, at the bottom? What happens if there's piping out of the tank, and that piping has a certain length and we're draining it somewhere else? That piping offers additional pressure drop, and that needs to be taken into account. I haven't gone into it here because this would be an entire exercise by itself, but the thing I would do is I'd go and generate the system curve for that piping, just like I did in a previous video where I generated the system curve for a two kilometer pipeline. Plot that pressure drop as a function of Q, fit a curve to it using an Excel curve fitter as an example, and that equation describes the pressure at the base of the tank for a certain flow rate through the pipe. So I have an expression I can go and plug into the pressure term that I previously cancelled out as being zero because it's not atmospheric. The pressure now is whatever the pressure drop through the pipe is. So this would take a little bit more integration, a little bit more maths. I actually don't know how challenging it would be, but at least you have the theory. If that was a bit too quick, go through it again yourself and prove that you can derive this yourself. The point is we're going to be using this final expression to make predictions of our own experiment. Let's go test. We start with this beer jug which I have marked at a 10 mm interval up to 180 mm. The beer jug is actually slightly conical in shape and so is a little irregular and it isn't that easy to measure a diameter. So I fill it up with water to a level of 180 mm and I weigh it. If I assume a specific gravity of 1, I know that the volume of water in the jug is roughly 1.8 liters. And from the volume of a cylinder, I calculate the diameter to be around 112 millimeters. I measure the bottom, which is a little bit narrower than what I've calculated. And I measure the top, which is a little bit wider. It's okay, I'm not going to sweat the small stuff. Now I've got drill bits from 2 up to 10 millimeters, and I'm going to test each of them. I start with the smallest hole of 2 millimeters, because it should be pretty obvious why I don't start with the largest drill bit. I do a quick check and I'm comfortable that we have a 2 millimeter drain. Now before I even start, I have set up a spreadsheet to predict how the level in the jug will change over time. So here I have a nice curve describing the level change if I use a 2 millimeter drain. And it looks like the jug will take around 10 minutes to empty. Let's go and see what it does. I've added some food coloring to better be able to see what's happening. So I'm not going to stuff around below a level of 10 millimeters because there will always be something left in the jug. But you can see that it actually took 14 minutes instead of the 10 minutes that I predicted to empty the jug. If we plot the experimental points from the video, you can see the general shape is fine, but the jug drained a lot slower than I predicted. I repeated this experiment for 3, 4 and 5 mm drain holes. and then again for 6, 8 and 10 mm drain holes. For all of these I've plotted both the theoretical as well as the actual points and you can see that I'm consistently under predicting how long it takes to drain my beer jug. Here I'm showing the theoretical time it takes to reach a level of 10 millimeters depending on drain hole versus the actual time I measured to get to 10 millimeters. 
the error in my predictions is about 50 to 80 percent. What's the reason for this? Well, Bernoulli's equation, which is where we started with this, is an expression for a continuous streamline of fluid and very importantly it assumes that there are no frictional losses and no viscosity effects in the flow. Can you see here that apart from the density of the fluid, there's no mention of viscosity or friction? Even my final expression for remaining volume in the tank says nothing about density or viscosity of the liquid. Obviously if I filled my beer jug with honey it would take a lifetime to drain and if I made the hole small enough it might not drain at all due to the surface tension of the fluid but Bernoulli's equation would tell us that it would drain just at a very low rate. So what do engineers do when the maths doesn't work? That's right baby, we slap a factor in front of the equation to make it work. In this instance we're going to give it the very official sounding name of a discharge coefficient and define it as the ratio of actual to theoretical flow. In other words, we're just forcing this thing to work. And I go back to all my maths earlier and every time I have a flow rate, I put a discharge coefficient in front of that term. If I now account for this in my spreadsheet, I can see that the discharge coefficient is between 0.58 and 0.66, meaning the flow is between 58 and 66% of what I predict with Bernoulli. I didn't do any fancy curve fitting, I just kept manually changing the cell until the curve looked good, as you can see me doing here. Another example of where we use discharge coefficients is in the orifice equation for orifice type flow meters. Most of the equation for the mass flow rate through an orifice comes from a derivation of Bernoulli's equation similar to what we did at the beginning. Then in order to make it match experimental data you can see it also has a coefficient of discharge in the front here. Another interesting thing to note is that depending on the extent to which the water was agitated after the food coloring was stirred, sometimes I formed a vortex where air was being sucked into the drain hole which effectively reduces the drainage capacity. Bernoulli can't account for that and I only noticed that this was happening halfway through the experiments. Look here how with a 10 mm drain hole I can either form a vortex or not depending on how much the water swirls around in the jug. One can find a lot of discussions online about how, especially in physics and maths, some of the most important and groundbreaking equations that we use have a certain beauty about them. They, aesthetically they look really appealing and they're beautiful in their simplicity. And I always think about this whenever I see any, any eng um, engineering equations, especially in, in, in chemical engineering, where we've taken something with a fundamental physical foundation uh, and we've slapped a lot, of, a lot of factors in front of it and we just go and screw everything up. Uh, and while I was being sarcastic and saying, oh, we're just slapping factors in front of everything, uh, we do that with love. Uh, it's not as if we throw away the physical foundation for something, we just correct the fact that real life happens and we still want to use these things and apply them. Because our other option would have been to drain my beer jug, plot the points and use Excel to fit some generic curve to it, some polynomial, but that polynomial is absolutely useless. Uh, I, I, I can't use it to extrapolate, I can't use it in a new design scenario. So we do want to keep the foundation and as well as good as possible we want to explain why it is that there is variation. Another example of this is uh, the ideal gas law PVNR equals NRT that looks very attractive but it doesn't work for real gases and a lot of equations of state go and build on that put factors in front of that and thermodynamic studies look at modeling those parameters for specific uh, for specific chemicals. So we see this a lot and uh, while we may be sarcastic about it, it's a really effective approach and it's the basis of, of how we design plants.